so Genesis Cloud. I was in Vancouver two weeks ago when, when these guys just uh, well, walked up to me and they are like, oh, hi, by the way, uh, we want to hire you. And uh, we are building this super cool cloud and it's a cryptocurrency and blockchain and the GPUs and AI and machine learning. And I was like, okay, I mean, what are you guys doing? Um, I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> so probably this is gonna be um, a chance for me to do so. Um, please uh, um, welcome Julian Dutch. Um, they are coming from M Munich. And uh, although yesterday they haven't had, but uh, today they already have a very nice presentation about what they are doing. Please welcome. Cool. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. As Mark correctly pointed out, we actually ran into Mark and Martin, two of the organizers here on the Open Stack Summit in Vancouver, and got talking. And then Martin approached us last week and said, hey, there's actually a spot free next week on the Open Stack Days. Do you want to give a talk? And we're like, sure, sounds good. I mean, to be fair, we have probably much less of an Open Stack achievement to present than Maybe all of you here. Um, but we have an interesting story, and we thought, why not tell it to the community and tell uh, you a little bit about our vision, where we want to go. So as you probably read, the title is From Cryptocurrency Mining to a Public GPU Cloud, a transformation story. And that's the maybe slightly different story than some of the other talks today that we would like to, talk, uh, to tell you today. Yeah, so um, thank you for having us here. Uh, as you may have heard, um, in the last year or so, cryptocurrency has been kind of on a, on a tear. And um, Julian and, and myself, uh, we, we started this company uh, very recently to basically take the, the success of the crypto and try to um, funnel it over into uh, something that's more um, public cloud consumable. So we want to talk about a little bit about our story. It's a different kind of talk than you may be used to at the OpenStack day. Um, we're going we're gonna to start with kind of where we came from, um, what we have today, and where we're going, and our vision then with OpenStack. And obviously, we're here, so we think that uh, OpenStack is going to be a very integral part of our, of our journey. Exactly. So uh, in order to understand a little bit where we from Genesis Cloud come from, what we are and why we're doing this, what we do, you have to yeah, explain a little bit about cryptocurrency mining and also our sister company, Genesis Mining. So I'm already apologizing if I'm mixing up Genesis Mining and Genesis Cloud in this talk. It happens sometimes. <laughs> Genesis Mining is the cryptocurrency side, Genesis Cloud obviously being the cloud side. So uh, that being said, anybody in here has, who has no idea what cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency mining is? Don't be, yeah? Okay, I can explain you later. If it's only one person, then I think I'll skip the summary and don't bore you with it. But as most of you probably noticed, either since your friend told you, hey, this is going crazy with the prices of Ethereum and Bitcoin, or maybe, uh, you wondered, why is my gaming GPU all of a sudden sold out or so expensive? Or maybe you had one of these little things at home or some of your friends. I'm sure maybe there's a few people in here who also run their own mining at home. So I think since last year, everybody has mostly heard about cryptocurrency mining. Genesis Mining, or especially their founders, actually um, were involved in the crypto space, I would say, long before most of the people know, uh, probably since... 2010, 2011 already. And they pretty early realized that um, mining is a really lucrative business. And they saw also that this is not just, you know, like a little hype, but this is actually a, a space full of opportunities and chances. And so they uh, took things in their hands and founded Genesis Mining, a company dedicated to cryptocurrency mining and especially cloud crypto mining. So that you as a private customer can go there and you can sign up and you give them normal money and they operate um, mining hardware for you in their data centers and you get the return of the mining in crypto. So you don't need to put one of those noisy hot things at home. 
Um, yeah, when I actually started here in the, on the side, you actually see a first generation miner. As you see, it still looks somewhat semi professional from a classical data center point of view. You might find it unprofessional. <laughs> Um, but with this off-the-shelf hardware, it allowed them to quickly get it started and open up their, old, uh, their first small data centers with it. And they quickly realized that they can push this further and that this goes well. And so they, by now, they're actually building very custom design mining hardware. So they have their own very own server nodes that they just designed for that purpose. Uh, Genesis Mining has a completely vertically integrated uh, supply chain, so they, we uh, Genesis Mining directly manufactures their stuff. For example, in China, they get their, their own GPUs with some custom tweaks and modifications as it suits them. I mean, as you can imagine, they are uh, one of the top uh, customers of both AMD and NVIDIA. So by now, um, yeah, and also something very interesting about uh, the whole cryptocurrency mining space, if you're not familiar with it, they operate on a very different time scale. So uh, it's quite normal that um, from the point where the data center is acquired and like electricity and so on is sorted out with the local energy provider and complete deployment of the data center until it's up and running is under three months. So it's quite a different scale. So, and they operate on a huge scale. To uh, give you some numbers and some ideas, as I said, like they started Genesis Mining in 2013, 2014. Customer uh, numbers have really exploded. This slide is, as I just see, not really up to date. By now, it's, as far as I know, roughly 2 million customers that they are serving with their cloud mining services. Uh, Genesis Mining mm, has data centers in more than 15 countries around the world. And just to give you a rough idea, they probably operate more than a million GPUs for mining. And yeah, that's quite a sheer scale. Um, now you might be wondering, like, where are these data centers? How do they look like? What has Genesis Cloud to do with it? So in order to give you a little impression of that, um, here we have a few selected ones of the Genesis mining data centers that we from Genesis Cloud are very interested in using too, or that we have started using too. Uh, the two main ones that we're actually focusing on right now being uh, Iceland and Sweden. Some of you might guess why Iceland and Sweden are good places for mining data centers. I don't know. I can tell you that electricity is extremely cheap there. Um, it's, there's a lot of energy, for example, in Iceland coming from geothermal, so it's actually nice green energy. Um, in addition to that, um, cooling pretty much comes for free, so it's a slightly more unconventional cooling style than some of the other data centers that are operated here. So we will tackle these uh, data centers we're actually tackling right now, and then the other ones in USA and Kazakhstan and China are actually uh, some that we are currently uh, evaluating for our next round when we increase our deployments. So to give you an idea, this is uh, Genesis Mining calls it the Enigma, which is in Iceland. So as you see, it has quite come a long way from uh, you know the garage with the GPUs plugged into a motherboard. Um, to give you an idea, that's the inside of just the Iceland facility of one. It's actually multiple buildings in the Iceland facility of the one you just saw. Um, to give you an idea, in this picture, you're probably seeing that must be about five, six thousand GPUs that are all operating. <laughs> and as you can also see, the the style of deployment and the the yeah the setup it's also a bit unconventional from a data center point of view. But it's very functional. It's a very extremely high energy um, density that uh, that allows it to operate this way. And another thing that we currently looking into, you might also realize it's always the same server node, <laughs> just GPU servers. And obviously, we're going to, so at the moment, this Iceland facility, for example, does not have storage nodes or uh, management nodes, which is what we're currently working on. To give you some other ideas, this is uh, another data center. This should be the Sweden one. And in the Sweden one, it's 
probably it's multiple tens. I think it's a few hundred thousand GPUs that are operated in there. So just to give you an idea. So as you see, it's not quite a standard telecommunication data center, but it's quite an interesting material to work with, I can tell you. So, so a little bit about the, the actual hardware, because this is where we get our hands dirty. Um, we have uh, the mining hardware, which is a custom-built server made by Genesis Mining, is what we call the Archer at uh, Genesis Cloud when we're um, giving some nomenclature. Uh, and the Ar Archer node, it has eight GPUs. It has uh, a dual-core processor, 16 gigabytes of memory, and um, one to 200 gigabytes of storage, depending on how we, we roll it out. And you could imagine, it's kind of like um, deploying OpenStack back in 2010 or 11, <laughs> when dual core was uh, still a thing. So we struggle a little bit with how to um, add these to our OpenStack cluster. And one thing that is, is more popular in our mind for actually how we deploy on an Archer node is through the use of like container orchestration. So we need to be very lightweight and lean. And then um, focus very specific workloads on those nodes. And then for the more general purpose GPU computing um, node, we have the Cirrus, which is essentially just an open compute project uh, GPU node um, that's originally started by Facebook. And um, we, we like open source things, so the hardware is very well dis defined. And it, uh, it's pretty mature. Some of the nodes that are older even work very well for our use cases. So what are we actually running on these things? Um, there's a few things that we run. And probably the easiest one that we've uh, started to uh, build out as a proof of um, concept is the rendering, the visual effects rendering frameworks. And uh, Blender is a very well-known tool. And then uh, for a rendering engine, they have the Cycles Renderer and the Net Renderer that distributes the workload from a master slave. And then we also have a partnership with AMD where we're working on actually deploying their, their Radeon Pro Render on Genesis Cloud. So you can see um, here a little screenshot of what it might look like. And it kind of integrates into the um, client's uh, desktop environment. And what they can do is basically real-time render still frames. And uh, we want to demo this at, at SIGGRAPH with AMD in August. So hopefully you'll see that as a, our first kind of um, proof of concept platform uh, that'll, that'll roll out in large scale with the Docker containers on Kubernetes. And just here's some, some snapshots of kind of how it looks when you get a, a rendered image out. Um, it's, it's very, could be photorealistic architectural drawings or it could be a full feature uh, film. The next thing is uh, video transcoding workloads. You may or may not know that uh, GPUs actually have these hardened bits of silicon in them that do encode, decode. And um, one of our ideas is to use this as a, as a kind of back-end service on an asynchronous um, transcoder that you know, when you're doing, say, mining or rendering jobs and you're not using that hardened bit of silicon, you can, you can kind of build an elastic transcoder again with Kubernetes and on top of OpenStack and kind of farm render jobs to it and be very cost-efficient way of kind of compressing videos and images that are normally very large and difficult to store. So we may use this internally for our own kind of optimization of storage, and then we'll offer it to our customers too. Another GPU workload that is maybe to some of you very obvious, to some maybe less, is, is machine learning. Machine learning, I guess most of you have figured out by now, it has had a pretty much a revolution over the last year, starting in roughly 2012, with uh, one of the core algorithms being deep learning that has really completely changed uh, what is achievable with machine learning. I think a lot of you by now have probably seen that uh, modern day uh, deep learning algorithms do extremely well in image classification, in uh, natural language processing, in sound processing, in sound to text. It's really amazing what has been happening there. And I mean, pretty much two of the core ingredients why this became possible, besides the actual algorithm it science, is the, the huge amounts of data that these days are just available and that companies just gather naturally and just hold on to. 
but one of the, I mean, in our opinion, bigger points is that in 2012, uh, GPUs were cheap and available and powerful enough to actually process these uh, deep learning algorithms. So of course, for us, this is a natural target to fit to. Um, one of the things that we want to early on tackle is uh, inference or prediction, so that you have a already trained neural net and you pass it your data, and on our cloud we run the prediction and return it to the client. Another thing that is of high interest for us is the deep learning training. So when you have all the data and you actually want to train your neural net to do this magic, um, you have the training process that actually takes way longer and way more time and way more compute than the actual prediction or inference. And this one can also be done on uh, multi-nodes. So there's uh, examples in industry of people running this on thousands of GPUs, literally. And so this is a great fit for our huge amount of compute power. And in addition to that, um, we're only already right now looking into spaces that have even higher demands for compute power, one of them being hyperparameter search, so that you, besides the actual architecture and the data of the net, there's a couple of hyperparameters like learning rates and other things like that. And you want to figure out which is the best of that, and but you can kind of only figure it out if you run the full training process with this set of parameters. And for us, with this huge amount of compute power that we have sitting there, this is really no problem to have multiple of these training processes uh, running in parallel. And another thing directly on that is uh, evolutionary architecture search, so that you actually uh, have an evolutionary algorithm figure out what is the best way of changing the architecture of the neural net, which right now, I don't know if any of you is involved in machine learning or deep learning, is a bit of al an alchemy process. So there you have a working recipe, you change it a little bit, and a lot of times it seems like black magic. But where we rather want to go is the picture that is shown there, where you can see it's a nice example, in my opinion, of deep learning, that you have a camera feed of a foreign language, you use a deep learning algorithm to directly uh, decode the language is written there, and you have another algorithm that directly translates it live onto your phone. And I think this is actually a cool example. Unfortunately, at the moment, I think this is these uh, uh, solutions are not yet perfectly working yet, but maybe with our cloud, we'll get there. Um, another application that we think our data centers in the future can be a very nice fit to is cloud gaming and virtual desktop for like modeling, rendering, and CAD applications where you actually need a GPU, but you don't want to have like a massive workstation sitting at your home. So uh, in simple, uh, the client just runs a, it can be a very thin client actually, and pretty much all the, only the, the keyboard and the mouse interaction is sent over IP to actually the cloud, where this is processed and uh, the heavy lifting is done. In the case of a game, the next frames of the game are actually rendered, decoded, and then sent back to the client. And whereas as where many people think of cloud gaming right now as, it, as being a bit cumbersome and not really interesting, it's still important to note that if you look at the global GPU sales, I mean, a lot of times people talk about you know, machine learning and all this hype and you know, autonomous driving and la la la. But if you actually look at the numbers, the lion's share of GPU sales for, for both of the big companies, it's still gaming, and it will be still gaming for a couple of years. That being said, there's a clear trend to move everything to the cloud, and with getting more and more bandwidth and lower latencies everywhere, it will naturally happen. So we want to be ready when uh, the software and the bandwidth is ready so that we can run this completely in the cloud too. Another so, yeah, so our, our, our vision uh, with OpenStack, um, it's, uh, it's why we're here, and essentially it's why you're here too. Um, but uh, we believe that um, we can actually take and repurpose this hardware that we've deployed, um, uh, and Genesis Mining has deployed uh, to actually do these diverse um, workloads. Um, we think that uh, with, with the infrastructure that we have and, and the scale that, that we're currently operating at, um, that we can basically be the, the largest GPU cloud in the world. Um, I know it's a little edgy to say that, but um, all the applications and the machine learning and all the, the applications we just mentioned, and if we believe that if we actually take the resources that we have, uh, like Julian said, the hundreds of thousands of GPUs, and make them available 
even you know a few at a time to, to people, they can start using them for a different economy of scale. Because as you know, if, if you are interested in machine learning and anything that runs on a GPU and you look in the public cloud, these things are very expensive to get by the hour and even spot pricing. So essentially, um, some of our vision is to actually lower the barrier of entry so that people that want to do interesting things and write OpenCL and CUDA code have a place to run it for um, something that's, that's you know, less than a dollar an hour, essentially. Yeah, directly on that. So obviously, the people at Genesis Mining, they realized that early on, and they got super excited. And especially when we did the rough math, and we, we saw, like, damn, like we're operating these data centers at such low prices. And Amazon is really charging crazy prices for a GPU instance. This seemed like a real natural fit. And um, yeah, as Dutch said, with the number of GPUs we have right now, if we had them already in a public cloud, <laughs> we would be easily like the largest. We would be currently. We would be actually. We did the rough math. There's no public numbers from the big ones, but we would be bigger than probably the GPUs combined of Azure, AWS, and uh, Google Cloud together. Probably. I mean, we didn't find real public numbers, but we tried to do the math as good as possible. Um, yeah, and. It just seems like a, a natural fit, and that's why uh, Genesis Mining decided to uh, get us on board and kick this off um, um, last year, and then we incorporated our startup this year. <laughs> so we're still pretty new. Uh, but the direction is kind of clear. I mean, we, uh, we really want to leverage all this know-how, all these interesting dynamics that and all this, uh, these processes that uh, Genesis Mining uh, created for the cryptocurrency space and that allowed them to become a billion dollar um, company, all this know-how we want to bring into the, the cloud space and as Dutch said, make GPUs available hopefully to, to everyone because I mean, if we can, like if we can't with the, the mining data centers get the cheapest price to everybody, then I mean, in no data center you can, right? right? And so uh, some of the things that uh, are really crazy there to see, I mean, like in, in the mining world, they, they often the return of invest for GPUs is just a few months, right? They, they operate extremely fast. They build up data science extremely fast. They can react to changes in technology extremely well. And all of this we hope to bring into, the, in our, into our data center too. So if there's a new type of accelerator coming up that we think, yeah, this will help everybody to benefit, we think that uh, we have the, <laughs> the logistics and uh, yeah, the support from Genesis Mining to do this extremely fast. Um, and OpenStack. That's, that's the only way that we think this slide. works, is, is, to, uh, <laughs> yeah. is to do it with OpenStack. So that being said, we will, uh, on, on the application side, we will focus on uh, rendering and machine learning as a first, because it seems like the best fit. But you cannot have any good application or any good platform or software without the correct underlying infrastructure. So uh, some of the areas where we are pushing into is, uh, as we've outlined already, with our hardware requirements and with our unconventional kind of rollout plan, we think that we can leverage the no hypervisor um, uh, technology, so using uh, system containers and application containers to deploy to deploy the workloads, and um, this is really yet to be done in in large scale in the public cloud. As far as I know, um, there are of course uh, private you know cloud use cases, and it makes a lot of sense from what uh, we've had our uh, tests and experiments on. But of course, there's always the issue of privacy. So I don't think the hypervisor is necessarily going away anytime soon. But for our particular workloads where you can do machine learning or rendering um, in kind of a multi-tenant environment, um, we, can, we can do certain things predicting a kind of customer behavior and, and how these applications function in order to make them secure. Um, and essentially, we buy back you know, anywhere between 5 to 15% of the runtime overhead, which it translates to cost that the end user ends up paying. So um, that essentially allows us to provide these very expensive accelerators to a more consumable and, and consumer-friendly kind of price point. Any, anything that we have to sacrifice on the actual hardware side, we hope to make it up in software. So it's kind of the modern phenomena of, of 
Kubernetes and container orchestration to see these um, software plans, platforms actually fail and then you know somehow survive. And this is largely in part due to like like web applications. But we've taken some of what we've learned there and what uh, is open source there and actually tried to feed it into the accelerator um, standpoint. And of course, not everything is redundant, but basically a lot of these bursty applications, like if you're running a training job or something and you're doing over like uh, 1,000 GPUs or something, it goes from taking a week where you know something disrupted your 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 cycle, or if, or if you all of a sudden you know ran your power bill up too much, to taking maybe hours where if you actually lost power or somehow something happened to your um, VM or, or instance, you could just recreate it, do the training again, um, and and have your results in less than a day. So as as Julian showed in the pictures too, there's like this hyper converged hardware. So what we're dealing with is a lot of like the same. Node, it's very homogenous. There's not a lot of infrastructure built to support like storage or compute. So we know that obviously there's there's a need for storage and compute applications and, and separation of these domains, but we're trying to kind of centralize this as much as possible to reduce our overall like cost overhead. Because essentially what we want to deliver is is the GPUs. And and the community that we're delivering them to is also very open source. So naturally it was a fit to use open source hardware to use open source software and kind of to keep our own um, software open source for the community. We think that the developers on, on open source projects are, are very, um, very good and very passionate and generally want to contribute. So as we're bootstrapping, we're still very small. Like you know, Julian said, we're just basically started this year. And we're still actually trying to find the people, the, the system architects and engineers and OpenStack experts to actually build the team up. and. Uh, Mark is, you know, he's he's joining us as he said, so um, everything's looking up. But uh, yeah, so on the OpenStack side, Cyborg, um, I was involved with Cyborg uh, prior. I was working on some FPGA accelerator um, stuff with with Huawei and and AWS, and and I found it very interesting that Cyborg kind of came out of the community and was interested in um, kind of reconfiguring accelerators and general purpose um, accelerator lifecycle management. So we plan to kind of be incre like incrementally incorporate that into our project. We know how these um, you know projects evolve in, in OpenStack, and we want to be there to kind of see it and help it grow. Um, Kubernetes is another thing that we're very excited about. It's a very complicated and much newer stack, so we're we're currently experimenting with our software applications, as you saw with the the Pro Render um, software application, and then with our inference APIs that we we build out and, and deploy for people that. Maybe don't want to take the time to to learn the dark art of of uh, neural network training. Um, we we think those will be deployed mostly in application containers on top of Kubernetes, and then lastly, um, contributing everything that we can upstream and keeping it kind of open source, and having a team that's also passionate about open source is our, is very in line with our vision and essentially why we're here. So you can see we all went to the the summit this year in Vancouver. And, and had we a great all time. joined. We all joined the Upstream Institute. Yeah. Thanks you guys for organizing. If anybody from the Upstream Institute is here, it was very interesting, and we're looking forward. It was a great. It was a great uh, summit for us, and we were very happy to see the the kind of mature um, community all building around OpenStack. So for us, that's a very good sign. So. Uh, before we can uh, conclude completely, I mean, you might wonder a little bit why we didn't show more of an uh, open stack architecture and all of these things. And this, it wouldn't be fair, as we said, we're still a young company. We have some good ideas, but we're currently designing. Hopefully, if we see you all again in Berlin this year on the Open Stack Summit, we plan to have a first public cloud ready by then. And we're very confident that it's going to work out. Um, as Dutch correctly pointed out, we are also we must actively hire because we want to get some of the most motivated people on board to try a little bit of a different open stack deployment on our hardware. And with that being said, I thank you all very much for the time and we are open for any questions regarding Genesis Cloud or also the crypto mining space. <laughs> thank you. Please feel free to have your questions now. Come on, everyone's That's talking okay. about cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. and GPUs and gaming. And we give AI. trading tips later outside if you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if there's no questions, then uh, I would like to thank you. I think is there? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, I 
two questions. Uh, one question is, um, what is the main purpose of having a distributed data architecture for mining? Because one would think that it never, might not make that much sense, like say, to, to have your cloud all over the world. Uh, like in case of general purpose of uh, cloud computing, it makes sense for you. But if you think of for mining, I don't see the reason, but I'm not so familiar with that. So first question. Let me first repeat it before I forget. So the first question was, uh, why for, uh, for uh, crypto mining, why there are distributed uh, data centers all around the world? You see very well how it makes <coughs> sense for computing, but for cryptocurrency mining, why not keep growing at one spot? Is that roughly correct? Okay, uh, directly going on this, um, there's multiple reasons. Uh, one of the first ones just being the limit of available power. <laughs> So uh, in some places, I mean, you always, I mean, these facilities, they, as, as you can imagine, I mean, they run m megawatt, right? So you need to directly approach the, the power providers and uh, make a deal with them. I mean, you cannot just say, hey, with this new company, uh, please give us uh, three megawatt of energy, right? And so, and also the price of the electricity is, uh, for the cryptocurrency mining is one of the, the, the major factors. So um, this is in a lot of places the, the reason how much can be scaled or not scaled. Uh, another reason is the, the, the mining data center at first is built with less of a redundancy and you're willing to accept a bit of less redundancy for that. So that being said though, when you operate one data center, like if you had all your data centers in one place and let's say the power plant would go down there, <laughs> all your hash power would be gone and your customers would not be super happy because you still promised to pay them. Um, so it's also some sort of diversification and a lot of it I think is just also opportunity driven. As I pointed out, like they really ramp up a data center in three months, right? And so uh, a lot of this is also um, driven by, okay, there's demand, we have decent supplies, we can do it, we have this opportunity there, let's do it. There's also like a philosophy aspect behind the whole cryptocurrency uh, marketplace and movement in general. And centralized kind of mining is, is not one of the philosophies that they, they subscribe to. Um, Genesis Mining was unique in that they actually passed on the, the, like the hashing power to the end user. So when you purchased a contract from them, it was actually you own the, the hash power. So Genesis Mining was, was performing a service for you, but essentially it was your um, hash power that, that you kind of owned indefinitely until it wasn't profitable anymore. And, and then also, you have to think when cryptocurrency um, transactions are made, they're actually backed by these data centers and by the peers on the network. So if you have all of the, um, all of the processes going through one central location, if that location goes down, then in, in basically... Or worse, if it gets hacked, right? Or if it gets yeah. hacked, which is um, something that of course can happen in this space, uh, then, then that's a big, a big issue for the entire community in general. Okay, I hope this roughly answers your first question. The second. And the second question is maybe sorry if you mentioned it, but um, so if I understand right, you're not ramping up additional hardware for your uh, new project, but rather reusing some existing hardware. So is the motivation? So what is the, the motivation? Uh, let's say reallocating the existing hardware so that you new areas instead of using it for mining, I suppose it's mining might not be that profitable anymore. <laughs> so no, so uh, his question was um, whether or uh, not we can use the old hardware or we do new hardware. And the question, if we use the old hardware, why doesn't the old hardware doesn't, uh, not continue mining if it's not profitable anymore? Something like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first thing that we probably didn't point out too much is, yeah, we're also looking into this completely um, integrated vertical supply chain to build our future generation of hardware. So we're not only relying on the legacy hardware. So we actually will build our own uh, hyperconverged nodes because uh, there's a couple of things like, the, for example, um, some of the high performance compute uh, loads you could not do on the legacy mining. They, they, they're really stripped of everything you don't need for mining, so there's some shortcomings if you want to do any general purpose computing, like uh, if you want to offer all sorts of general purpose computing on them. Um, that being said, there's still probably 
the cheapest hardware compute you can offer in a cloud at all. So anything that runs on them, we will be able to deliver at the most competitive price that we could imagine. So that being said, uh, they are doing mining and they're profitable. Um, but um, most jobs, I don't know if you ever did the math on how much you can make of a GPU with mining versus when you run a rendering job or a deep learning job on it. I mean, you have to see it the other way. If mining was more lucrative than renting it out as compute, I mean, Amazon would just do, com uh, do, would just do mining, right? They wouldn't rent out any GPUs anymore. So we see it more as another way we, that we have this nice uh, elasticity, that we have this big pool of mining um, hardware, which we do mining. And if there's a couple of jobs coming in, we can run the job, it's done, we can take it back, and this mining hardware can run with zero idle time. And this is a nice plus. I hope this answered your question. Cool. Okay, any more questions? Otherwise, we will be around, and we're happy to take any questions Please later. don't hire everyone here, because <laughs> we also need to provide some people to Nokia and uh, Susie. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>